Thanks for watching DJ Rentrix and DIY. Over here you can see we have been very busy. This is actually the Matrix under a car cover. I have been having to deal with a whole ton of repairs that I wanted to put in a timely manner, so I figured I would do a three project update, basically. This is my little hack uh, to get from the city to quit harassing me. So I need to get this thing off the jack stands, and I have been doing tons of repairs, so let's get into it. Now to get our axles out, we're going to use screwdrivers, just pop them out, hide a seal puller on one side and a screwdriver on the other. For the install, we're going to use just whatever you have around for grease. This is some good high quality Valvoline Synthetic. It's Molly Fortified, which is good for the axles. It'll help it slide in much easier because on the driver's side, it is a pain to get it in. It has to be centered. And what you want to do is I kept trying to, where's my grease? I kept trying to just push it in and line it up, but just because of the nature of the grease, it's going to be flared out a little bit. I mean, the nature of the seal. So the best way is to try to catch a corner and just basically knead it in and roll it. If it's hard, it's kind of like kneading it, you know, like whoosh. you kind of like roll it in and push down, but at an angle. And eventually, once you get about halfway, you'll have one little corner and that's where I kept getting stuck. I ended up taking the seal back out, cleaning it all up, doing the good grease this time. I usually use uh, Vaseline, so I was trying Vaseline the first time, don't bother with that. And I put it in the freezer for about 15 minutes, try to harden it up and shrink it down a little bit, and it popped right in. If you don't have one already, buy or rent a seal driver. They have multiple different sizes on them. It's very easy to put it in. Having something to drive the seal in, it'll make life much easier and save you some time. This is a seal I was mentioning earlier that is quite difficult to get in. You have to go real slow. As I said, I'm trying to spin it while I'm pushing down. We want to make sure we have a fair amount of grease all over this to try to help slide it in. You want as little friction as possible because since it's flared out, I mentioned when you're rotating it, it's not only trying to force itself out, but as you're pushing in, it's also trying to kink a little bit, as I would say. It will just stop rotating at some point. Just go very slow, be patient, and you'll get it in. Don't damage the seal. Keep your seal a once over, get a nice bright flashlight, make sure everything's all lined up, no weird rubber poking out, no cuts or anything weird and move on. One side done, one more to go. Now it's time to flip it over and do the drive side axle. We are going to have a hard time getting this out using a normal screwdriver unless you have something massive. You'll see here, eventually I graduate to a small or medium sized crowbar, something that's gonna be very wide and stiff and we're trying to hook the back metal piece of your seal. It is very stuck in there, but you have to be careful not to scratch the inside surface. So once you do get it loose, just kind of bump it out and then you can just grab it. Now we clean everything up, prepare the new seal with some molly grease and reinstall it. So I learned this one the hard way. I'll show you how I did it anyways, because I'm not going to be on this YouTuber to lie, but do not do the seal driver on this side. Use either a piece of PVC like I have here, or you'll need a very large socket, something like this. The size of the diameter on the seal is 48 millimeters. It's quite large. This is my biggest one I have. It's only a 36. I don't have very many large sockets like that. So if you don't have that, get a 1 and 7 8 PVC. Unfortunately, the one I just dropped, way too big. So I couldn't use that. But you will need that because the stack of that seal where the CV actual slides in and seals around that, it's just too much. And using the seal driver damages the spring on the inside. Mine is actually leaking a tiny bit right now. So kind of annoying I'll have to pull it back out but really it's not that big of a deal it's like a 30 minute job so get you a socket preparation or get you some pvc don't damage your new seal don't be a dummy like me carefully remove your throughout bearing fork boot we're going to remove the fork itself and then we're also going to remove the throughout bearing 
You're going to need something strong like brake cleaner to clean inside the bell housing. Mine had lots of material. It's going to be quite a bit of a mess. You want to make sure to do the best job we can here. Get it as clean as you can. Also, this stuff is nasty. Get yourself a real painter's mask from 3M that is chemical proof and something that you can get like people use in a body shop with replaceable cartridges. Those filters are pretty cheap alone. So get something like that. Really save yourself from inhaling all this junk. Taking a look at your old throat bearing, you can see where it wasn't greased before and there's going to be wear marks here and here. Right by this pin is where you want to put a little dab of grease. And you want to take your fork and you want to get the ball point and both of the tips on the fork. I'll show you them now. So you definitely want to clean this. And that too. We're going to clean all this now. Now's a great time to double check for any debris and stuff like that as well. Clean it all out. The last chance to do so. Loosen everything up with a brake clean. Pop your clip out here. Wipe it all up real well. Should wipe right out with some brake clean. All right, so we want to get a good amount of grease in here and on the tips, as I mentioned, and I'm going to use the Valvoline Molly grease that I've been using. You don't want a crazy amount slinging all onto your clutch eventually, so we're just going to put a nice thick layer, something that will last a long time. Make sure you don't get any abnormal wear. Also, I definitely forgot to clean the input shaft as well. You will definitely need to clean where the throat ring rides on it, the collared part and re-grease it. So we put the grease on the throat springs like we discussed earlier. We move on to the input shaft. Now we reinstall the fork and the throat bearing, and I like to give it a few little tests, make sure that it rides nice and smooth up and down. Your new clutch will come with a tiny little tube of lubricant, and we're going to use that grease on the input shaft splines, liberally cover it all, as well as the clutch disc, we're going to get in the splines is that as well. Unless you have a very low mileage car, mine is 130,000, so I'm gonna go ahead and do the rear main engine seal before we go ahead and mess around with the flywheel. I wanna do lots of cleaning back here, install a new seal, so we're gonna do that right now. This seal is so large, trying to use a traditional seal puller is kind of hard. Some people put screws in and pull them out with like vice grips. I didn't want a chance putting any scratches in the area of the engine, so I just slowly work my way up and work my way around. And once you get a crease, just grab it with some needle nose pliers and it'll pop right out. And then we're ready to slide the transmission back in. And what we're trying to do here is hook it into the steel backing of this seal here. And you can see right the top here where I got a good hook into it. And then I was able to pull it out a good bit. And then I pulled it rest way out with new nose pliers. For our new seal, you want to make sure the inside part doesn't roll. You want to keep it nice and straight when it goes in. And don't forget to coat your seal in this Molly Fortified Grease. And again, because I mentioned the seal is so large and it is so stiff, it is going to actually try to uninstall itself on me a few times here. You really need almost a second person to try to give yourself a hand or try to just use, switch to using a small hammer. That's what I did to really try to help it bite into there. It's going to naturally just try to pop out when you work your way around from one side to another. And once you got it in, you could go over it with the extension and just make sure it's nice and flush, riding all the way around. Just tap, 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 tap.
all cleaned up and the install looks great. Showing you up close here that the lip has not rolled and it is pressed onto the crank as it should be. New flywheels come with some type of oil on them to keep them from rusting, so make sure you get a ton of brake clean and thoroughly clean the back side and front side of this. Make sure we have a super clean to the touch feel. With that said, make sure you have clean hands as we install our new flywheel. I like to stick one little bolt partially threaded in to help me line up the holes. For ARP bolts, they give you a tube of grease. You put that in the chamfer of the bolt head basically right in between where the threading meets the actual bolt head. And then once you have that nice and smoothed out, you follow that up with some blue Loctite to the tip of the threads. Since I'm using ARP bolts for the flywheel, I'm using a 16 millimeter bolt. If you're using OEM Toyota hardware, you will need a 14 millimeter. We wanna work quickly as possible as we can here. You don't want the Loctite to dry. And to prevent that, I'm going to go ahead and hand thread in every single bolt to the very end so then there's no Loctite exposed to the air. One nice thing about the ARP bolts is not just that they are reusable, but they are very easy to install. All you need is some blue Loctite. You don't have to worry about 90 degrees or any of this weirdness. We are just going to torque it to 70 foot-pounds, and we are going to do this with the stock pattern, which I will show you here right now. So if you have normal hardware, I will also show you we're going to use a stock pattern, and you will be doing it with 90 degree rotations. I'll have a link for you to follow this, but the instructions are right here too. Having a flywheel tool around makes your life way easier for this job. You might be able to have a second person wedge a screwdriver somewhere, right where I have mine on the left side there, but otherwise I would just use the tool. Now make sure to give everything one last clean. We want to have a nice, good surface for the clutch to grab onto. No oil, no grease, none of that. Make sure you pay attention to this graphic. You want to make sure your clutch disc is going in the correct way into the pressure plate before we do our install here. So the flat side should be facing outward, going towards the flywheel. And the side that has a hub on it, you'll notice is much thicker on that side. That side goes inwards into the pressure plate. This is very important. You could shatter your clutch disc if you put it in the wrong way. You don't want to have to do this job again. All right, quick note on this little collar here from ACT. There is a beveled end and a flat end. The beveled end goes in much easier, I noticed. So I'm showing you here. Give it a good little tap once you think you have it all the way in with a nice big spark plug socket. And then your installation will be complete and we can move on to doing the clutch disc. Just a little grease as we used on our input shaft. We're going to use it here on the splines. Again, we don't need a ton of it all over slinging all over our new clutch, so just enough to get a good liberal coating all over everything. Slide it together really easy. Okay, so 12 millimeter for these bolts. The torque is 14 foot-pounds, and we're going to start at the top right as soon as we get down and skip every other bolt going clockwise. I'll show you the diagram here too. Because the clutch disc is so hard to push down from the rivets on the flywheel, I'm actually just slowly running down the first three bolts. Very little torque. There's almost no tension. It's literally just pulling it completely flush to the flywheel. I like to do the torque down in stages on this too. So once I get all the bolts in, I'm gonna go about six foot pounds, then 12 foot pounds, then about 14 foot pounds. If you want, you could just skip from six to 14 as well.
you'll need this bad boy to grab onto the flywheel to help you torque down everything. Oh boy, let me tell you about this. Do not try to do this by yourself. Please do not, please do not. Uh, I struggled very badly, and it was not a good time. And the transmission will try to fall on you. Just don't do it. Get a friend to help you. Time to install it though. Definitely want to make sure that it is going to slide in easily. We do not want to force anything. Again, we do not want to break our clutch. Also, if you and your partner feel like you need a break and your strength is running out, <laughs> forewarn the other one and just give yourself a little bit of a break. It won't take too much time for you to get it right back up there in one more effort. It'll go in eventually. Have some patience and just don't hurt yourself. See, we're very close on the pellet housing here. I don't want to use bolts to pull it all the way in. I want to make sure it's done right. So track it back up from the bottom again. And then we're going to shimmy it back into place the rest of the way. Only about a half inch. I have to play with the level of our jack here to test how close you are. Try the bottom bolt over by the oil filter for the bell housing first. If it threads in fairly easily like mine is, you're going to be nice and level. We don't have to go that far, just about halfway. And from the driver's side wheel well area, I pop in and just shove the transmission a few times while shaking it left to right. It doesn't take much to just pop right into place. It's all lined up right. It should just pop right into place just like it did there. Perfectly, perfectly flush and perfectly mounted. Next step, we just do the bell housing bolts. I'm not going to show you that. It's kind of hard for me to film it and also not be in the way and do the work at the same time. So. Skip to that. Uh, I'm just going to do it by hand. I'm sure it's going to be like over 50 foot pounds of torque, but they're pretty tight. So don't worry too much about torquing them if you can't. Here are the torque specs for your bell housing on the transmission. It is all the bell housing bolts installed. Now is the perfect time to add some energy suspension polyurethane bushings which slide into our existing motor mounts. These are gonna really stiffen them up. It's gonna give you a lot less motor movement back and forth, forwards and backwards, because these go to those mounts only. And they're very budget friendly. So instead of trying to find new OEM mounts, this is an excellent way to liven up your engine bay and do it on a budget. From this moment onward is going to be using the jack as your friend, trying to make space, moving the transmission here, there, and everywhere as we try to relocate it back towards its mounts. So trying to get these brackets in there, just slowly but surely work it around. Don't be afraid to grab the transmission and kind of shove it out of the way. You'll get it in there eventually, but it is key to lining up this bracket to the bolt holes, especially the top bolt hole. That one gave me a, a fair amount of trouble before I realized you need to pull where the oil pan has been held up this whole time. We need to go ahead and remove that and that will help the transmission achieve a better angle and the top bolt will go in much easier. Before we remove that jack stand from the engine oil pan, we want to make sure you do the mount bolt hole through the middle here. That will really make sure that we're fully supported since we already have the bottom bolt installed and then we'll have the center bolt through there. This makes also lining up the top bolt even easier. And right about here, I was like, wait a second, I think this jack stand is stopping me from getting this angle. So I quickly hammer off a piece of the wood and it's no longer being balanced on there. Now the hardest part is trying to get my big hands, trying to get them to turn the bolt through the center here. At the end here, I figure out one hand through the bottom to try to hold the bolt up and one through the top to spin it and use those two fingers. Or if you can get three in there, even better. And eventually, once you get a few threads on, hit it with a ratcheting wrench and you'll be done in no time. For the bottom bolt, you could get to it with a normal 3 8 ratchet and a short socket. But also, I will be using a breaker bar just as tight as I can get them. Torque down your center bolt and then we're all done. We move on to the next mount. If you're really interested in the torque values, I will put the diagram here for all of the motor mounts because I'm not really going to torque any of them to tell you the truth. I'm going to do the same thing with my Milwaukee M12. Give it three Ooga Doogas and let it ride. While you're here is a perfect time to grab your ground strap from the strut tower to the side of the transmission by this mount we just did. So go ahead and tighten that up now. Next we're going to hook up our clutch line to the top of the transmission. Run the slave cylinder back to the side, hook that up to the throwout bearing fork, and the torque values and the diagram, everything is here for you to check out. Alright, now that that's all done, let's move on to some of the wiring in the area. 
Next, we have two grounds to install, one by the battery driver's fender area, 10 millimeter. The next one is the top of the transmission. That will be a 12 millimeter. And then we're gonna move on to the wiring. For the wiring, it has a harness mount that I'm holding here. And on the bottom of it, it is supposed to hold the grounding wire. Mine is broken, yours probably is too. Just run some electrical tape on either side of it. Keep your wiring nice and clean. Through the driver's side wheel well, we can access and hook up both shift cables with the washers and the clips that it comes with. If you are going to use the original stuff, they have rubber bushings in them and to prevent mischiefs and stuff, there's a really nice upgrade you can do at this moment. You could get brass shifter replacements for the bushings and to get them out, what you're gonna have to do is get some needle nose pliers in there. I tried to pry them out a little bit, kind of hard to get them to pry out, but if you push them on something solid, like maybe a socket or a piece of the transmission and then press down with the needle nose pliers, they will just pop right out like you see them do right here. We'll put the new brass bushings in with a tab of the grease that comes from the manufacturer. Switching over to the other cable was a bit more difficult. It's a little shorter. You can't really press it onto the transmission piece sticking up like I did on the last one. So try to pick out little bits of it, the rubber pieces with an actual pick. Just slowly get little chunks and chunks and eventually you could get your needle nose in there. You just get a little triangle or circle piece out and then you could pop it right out. If it's really rusty, you can drill it out as well. Get a 3M scouring pad and make sure you clean up the mounting ends real well on the shift cables here. We wanna make sure the grease sticks the best it can. It'll last as long as possible. You don't wanna deal with any rust issues later down the road. I went ahead and split the grease tube up between both mounting points there, so completely used it all. Before I clip the brass bushings into the plastic little ends there, what I wanna do is make sure I just smother them in grease. All over the place, just distribute it the best you can. The bushings have a groove cut in them for the C-clips, so face them outwards, and then we will go ahead and install both the clips. If you have some gloves on, you can install them by hand. They slide on pretty easily. Finish this side up with a pin. Now we do the exact same thing to the other side, but this side being the shorter side is a little easier to take back out. And this time what we'll do is go from the top of the engine bay. I didn't catch this on film, unfortunately. The angle's really hard, but get some needle nose pliers from the top of the engine bay and just stick one part through the middle and the other part to the top of the C-clip and just press it down. Our second one here is harder to get on the clip. So what you should do is from the top here, spin it like this towards you. And if the clip right here isn't facing it, where the C should be facing the firewall, just spin it around. Like I have it right here. And we're going to set it like that. And take a pair of pliers like I did off camera here and just squeeze it. And it will push the clip all the way in. You can see both are installed nice and clean. Hard to see this second one here. Now, next for me to do is install these clips here. But that explains how to do the brass inserts. Use some extensions, half inch, something big like that to tap these C-clips right on in. Now it's time to reinstall the top motor mount. The old ones had thread locker all over the threads, so I'm going to clean them up, do the best you can. 14 millimeter on these bolts. We're going to reapply some red thread locker and then keep it moving. At this point, if you're like me, you are going to become quite fatigued from this very long and drawn out project. Do not forget the transmission jack is your friend if you do not have bolts lining up. I did forget that and you will notice the top right bolt of this motor mount on the screen. I'm having extreme difficulty lining it up and I finally get it at the end there after I do the three other bolts when I figure out, oh, I need to jack this up some more to get the angle a little more centered. One of the most important tips for these all three motor mounts, you will definitely need a good 14 millimeter ratcheting wrench. So absolutely get one if you don't have it already. Finally, after multiple ups and downs, here we go, we got in. All right, all we have left for the top motor mount is the center bolt here, and because my mount is fairly worn, if yours has over 100,000 miles, it's gonna be the same thing. It is binding on the far side of the mount, so it is actually crooked. Because of this, it's extremely hard to get the bolt to go completely through because it's actually hitting the back side of the mount. So what you need to do, and I figured this out after multiple tries of trying to figure out what the heck do I do? I didn't wanna take my mount back out and try again, but you can, since the mounts are hollow as we showed before, you can take a screwdriver, push it, through the top part and I will have a clip here for you to look at where you can actually push that end that's not meeting up down flat 
and then you could push your bolt through straight. If you're having a problem, you could use the rear mount motor mount bolt, which is what I did here in the beginning to try to bring the clamshell a little further in. And then if you could run your normal bolt in there and it's a little bit easier to get it all together. All right, once you're all situated here, run your normal bolt, torque it down, and then what we need to do next, we're going to move on to the wiring, pull all that back out of the way. The first thing we have to do, there is one plug directly in the middle of the top of the transmission removed. Before we plug that in though, we're gonna go ahead and the wiring harness has another body clip mount. You're gonna go ahead and slide that into the metal piece there. Go on and clip your clip in. And there's another EGR, look for a blue plug. This goes right near the brake master cylinder. All right, and for our last motor mount is going to be the rear motor mount. We have a thick and a thin side for the inserts that are going to go into this one. You'll see later in the video, I actually tell you which one goes on left and right sides. It's time to slide our bracket in from the top area, the rear engine exhaust area, as you can see. Nice big hole there. If you went ahead and took off your mid pipe and catalytic converter like I did, you have tons of space here. If not, it's only four bolts, two on each flan. It's really not that hard to get off. Then a bracket to hold it up, two 10 millimeter bolts. Anyway, I digress. We are moving on. If you have the mount inserts in backwards, the bracket will not slide all the way on. So as you can see, I had to test it and I had mine backwards. Make sure you have it on your right sides there. Once you do, it will slide on. Helps to pinch it together, kind of sandwich the rubber inserts in with your other hand to try to run it down and get it in there. And then try to line it up. In order to thread in your bracket bolts by hand, we'll have to center this center bolt. So go ahead and get that done. With a screwdriver, that is your best bet to get the center bolt lined up. And we'll throw in our bracket bolts at the same time. And then we're going to move on to tightening it. Basically just grab the largest Phillips head you could find and that's going to pull the center in for you right there. Just like with the top motor mount, you will need the 14 millimeter ratcheting wrench again. You can see the pictures here kind of showing you a little collection of is very tight spaces and how you're going to have to get in there to tighten these bolts. But we're going to go on to moving the two bracket bolts and then putting in our center bolt once we got it all good. We also don't want to forget though, we have the exhaust manifold bracket as well to do. So we're going to put all of these in right now. And as you can see, there's no jack stands on the engine or on the transmission, and that is how you're going to center this bolt in the back here. Thread your center bolt in once you got it centered up, and go ahead and give it three oogadoogas just like I did, brap, 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 and then you're done. All right, we have two last wires. One of them is for the mass airflow sensor, a big, wide, rectangular shape, and then the other one goes right below the blue EGR one. I believe this is another HVAC EGR thing. Clip those two in real fast. If you have the air box, as I mentioned before, you do need to clip in your brown one to the air box as well. Before you put your battery in, I'm not gonna show that, but we are gonna go ahead and put the fuse box back together. The harness clips into the box, three plugs, a 10 millimeter bolt on the end, and you're all done. Time to throw in the passenger axle and the nut. We have a brand new nut here. You should definitely replace yours. Before installing both axles, clean up the ends and then put a light layer of the CV axle grease on there and then install them. We wanna pull the flange flush to the bracket and you wanna line up the two bolt holes. We have two 14 millimeters, go ahead and install those. And then we're gonna go on to the spindle side. Grab a handful of your brake caliper there and swing outwards on your strut. Give yourself some room. You could bend the CV axle inwards, get it through into the hub. And once you do that, we're going to move on to the lower ball joint. There's two different types. Both of them get 66 foot pounds. The bolt, the singular bolt, I added on some red Loctite. Mine had some before. I'm not sure if it's supposed to have it or not, but it won't hurt. Torque down the CV axle and then we move on to the driver's side. Once we slide in the driver's side, it's going to be a little bit trickier to get in, a little harder than the bracket side. But once we slide it into the hub as well, 
you can actually kind of take the brake and the rotor and just bang it into place a little bit. And you can see the C-clip will start to move into the actual transmission. So you want to use the flat spots on the edge of the CV axle and a screwdriver, a big hammer, and just slowly work your way around and bump it into place. You will notice and hear the C-clip actually tink pop into place and you've known your CV axle is now in. It's hard to see, but it will be sitting flush with the metal dust seal on the end of the CV axle into the actual rubber seal we just installed. We're going to do the same thing to this side. Stake the CV axle nut, put in the lower ball joint, put in the red Loctite on the bolt, 66 foot pounds for the lower ball joint, put both wheels on. And the last thing we have left is fluid. We are getting really, really close. It's getting dark really early now at like 4.30. It starts to get really hard out to see. So I didn't bother filming this, but I used my very large Icon torque wrench. You can see here, things quite big. So I was able to just do that without a pipe. We're going to take our 30 millimeter socket to 159 foot pounds. Do not forget to torque that. And then we're going to stake it, which you will see next. And if you aren't having a cold air intake like I do, this is to your air box. This is to the vacuum solenoid to open it. Okay. I'm working on my intake here, trying to get this bracket area in a correct position so it's not rubbing on here like it has been. But one of our last steps is to do our vacuum lines. I've already done that. We want to go right here next to the PCV. And this is that double pipe that came right off in the very beginning. One side to the throttle body, a little and a big one, as you can see right here. And that splits off and goes to, I believe, this is the HVNC solenoid, so EGR or something like that, blue plug. That's where it goes, that valve. So first things first, for the intake, it is, we have lots of movement, no hitting, anywhere. This space right here under the fuse box has, you can see the wheel well is there. So this kink spot under the battery could hit it, but I have it perfectly mounted. I had basically taken the corner of the bumper. There's a headlight bolt here. I had the other ones out, pulled the headlight completely out, pulled the bumper back, and I set it in a good spot over here. And as soon as I had the throttle body all set up over here, nice and clamped down to where I want it, you can see I'm gonna have like this mark to where I, I know where I want it rotated in the clamp. But I bent this real good with some pliers, the original OEM mount here. And what I've done is there was, get on the battery here. There was this little rubber isolator and I've seen you know, on other intakes that they actually use the isolator down here in a bra bracket below that, which is I think a better idea, but whatever I digress, I stole that idea because there was an isolator right here for the fuse box and this like flat bolt that it was made to. So I drilled the hole in it and removed that and on the inside, right in here, there is a M6 bolt, which I ordered an isolator very similar to this. This one was one inch longer, gave me an M6 bolt on both sides, so it's nice and set up with a fender washer. Super solid. No hitting anywhere. No hitting by the headlight or anything. Now the only thing we have left to do is just add transmission fluid. Here is where you do not want to put the transmission fluid. Everybody says this is the plug. It is not. You want to use the plug to the right. That is the fill plug and you definitely wanna make sure we jack the vehicle up because to properly add fluid and read it correctly, we need it to be level. It only takes 2.3 quarts. Because we need to change the little washers, the crush washers on both the fill and the drain plug, we are going to drain the whole transmission. And while that's getting drained, we're gonna go ahead and clean both the plugs and add new crush washers. All right, so when it comes time to fill up your fluid here, for the transmission, I use this, just a cheap fluid transfer pump. It doesn't move very much fluid. It doesn't really thread into the actual diameter here of our bottle. I think this is more for like oil shaped ones for automatic transmission fluid, something more like this. So if you have a lot of time and patience, use this. It's what I had, so I used it. Another option is this. You would grab a funnel, a long tube, you need something slightly longer than this, you would go from the top of the engine bay all the way down to the fill tube, stick that guy into there, 
and just slowly pour it in there. And it's a little easier since you're from the top. You can actually just kind of pour some in and look at your little label here. When you're underneath the car, it's kind of hard to see anything. And this isn't really that easy to see either. And you're sitting here trying to pump it. It's, just, it's a long drawn out process with the transfer pump. Maybe I just got a crappy one. This is a pretty ingenious way to do it though and do it quickly. So once you have your fluid all in, you just drop the car and put your wheels on, and congratulations, you have successfully completed your job here. It has been a long, long job with lots of small parts and big parts and all that in between, but you have now completed the job. Congratulations, and thanks for watching G2 Ranch Works and DIY. If you want to support the channel, please do. You can find us over at Patreon. You can also find us on YouTube memberships where we have two different types, and you can support us there. I'd greatly appreciate it if you did. Thanks.